Good morning. I just uh, saw a bear, uh, four mountain goats, and uh, a teacher walking down the hall. Yes, that's right. I, obviously, I'm still filming from inside my classroom. It's early morning coffee, so uh, time to wake up. Good to see everybody again. Um, hopefully, it is uh, Thursday if things are working the way that I want them to. And so, if that's the case, we're going to continue to push forward. Remember, tomorrow you're going to have a quiz. Uh, your quiz is basically on the last portion of Exodus. So, um, everything, for lack of a better word, everything is free game uh, from, let's say, 20 to 40. Okay? Um, it will be open Bible. You'll have 15 minutes tomorrow to take it. Shouldn't be too complicated for any of you guys, uh, though I will admit that I'd like to see some better grades than the 76s that I've seen from a few of you. This is a Bible class for, you know, for uh, for all that it's worth. So give me your best effort. Um, get an idea of what's going on here. This is one of those sections where the student that is the best at being able to uh, search and find is going to do well because we're going to start getting into things that you probably have not memorized and thought about. Um, instead, they are, um, you know, difficult subject matters like uh, how many curtains were in the tabernacle and who could go into where and and all those kinds of things. When we prep for our next test, which will be after I get back, that test will actually have um, um, a tabernacle that we will draw uh, on the actual test. So we'll get there. Don't worry about that. It's nothing to be stressed about uh, at this point in time. Uh, if you go to Exodus chapter 24, and specifically once we get over in 25, I want us to begin reading there. You should, again, have a Bible out and be ready to go so that you can keep up with me. Um, today I'm going to do some more uh, pointing out and calling, so let's uh, make sure that we're paying attention and ready uh, so that we understand what's happening. So I want you to think of this. God's people are wandering around the wilderness. Um, they keep having problems, obviously. The law is being given to them, at least from the standpoint of the things that they need to do and how they need to act, and it's still not complete. Um, and part of the law is going to entail something that is to be done, specifically regarding the ideas of worship, uh, sacrifice, etc. And that something will be the building of what we define as a tabernacle. Tabernacle, the word in Hebrew means to dwell among. And it's why uh, in Scripture we literally read in the New Testament that God came and tabernacled amongst them. In other words, it meant that he came and dwelled. It's being used uh, as a verb there, um, not just the idea of a building. And yes, it's a building, and much less, more or less, a glorified tent is really what a tabernacle is. It will eventually become a temple, uh, as David will desire to build a temple and can't do so because he spends all of his time in war. Uh, his son Solomon will indeed finally build a temple, uh, and it will be a pretty significant temple uh, when you think of it that way. It is interesting to note that the temple won't survive. It is interesting to note that, uh, that God then decides to call what we define as a building at times, uh, the church as really people, and I think it's because God doesn't necessarily care that we go into a very nice and ornate building, and there's nothing wrong with it, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is, is that we are there to praise and to glorify and to bring honor to, and it's something that should open our eyes to the ideas that we have the ability to do that in the, somebody's front yard sitting down on the grass. But for this sake, God wants his people to be willing to follow instructions, and God wants to have a place in which he can come and be with his people, to tabernacle or to dwell amongst them. Uh, and so we'll see some of that. So notice what happens there in chapter 25 as we need to get stuff, right? I mean, that's just as simple as I could say. Um, if we're going to build something, we have to have things to build things with. And here we are as a group of people in the wilderness. We don't have other groups of people with us. Um, and so I want you to notice what we do to get these things. It says, the Lord said to Moses, verse 1, Speak to the people of Israel that they take for me a contribution from every man whose heart moves him. You shall receive the contribution for me. 
So basically what he says is, he says, I want you to ask the people. And whoever has a heart that desires to give, let that person give. That's what he says. Really no different than what's commanded to us today in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Uh, for when I come, let there be no collections made, but each man should lay by in store as has been given to him uh, on the first day of the week. Really the idea is, is what did you decide to give? How did your heart draw you to do so? Now, granted, as we look throughout the Old Testament, they will eventually be given the ideas of tithing, uh, giving a tenth of everything that they have, uh, and that tenth will be something that is a, uh, a biblical requirement for God's people at the time. And so, needless to say, hard or not, he expected something to be done. Uh, and I think he still expects us today to do something in the sense of our giving but the heart plays a vital role in it. Uh, Scripture is very clear when it talks about the idea that God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, so these people should have been moved. And how, why would they be moved? Well, you know, uh, God's preparing to build a big tent or tabernacle. He's going to come down and be part of his people. Uh, and I'm alive today because he did what he did. That's enough to move me, right? Um, I'm alive today because he saw me through. Uh, the Red Sea. I'm alive today because he saw me through, um, you know, the 10 plagues and coming out of Egypt. I, I, whatever it is. So what I want us to do is I want us to get this, this overview idea of how amazing it is that we at times don't see what he did for us and then we don't desire to repay that. God's people are the same way. They're no different. They made the same mistakes, the same errors, the same what have you done for me lately type mentality. And so, again, I don't want us to be so quick to judge these people without judging ourselves or thinking about who we are. But I do want us to learn from the things they do. But look at what happens. Verse uh, 3, and this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Here's what he wants. Gold, silver, and bronze. Well, he's already asking for a lot. Blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. Goat's hair. Tanned ram skins, uh, goat skins, acacia wood, oil for the lamp, spices for the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, onyx stones, and stones for setting for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. In other words, a tabernacle that I may dwell in their midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all its furniture, so you shall make it. So if you happen to look from verse 10 of chapter 25, and if you look all the way through uh, to, let's see, should be at least, the end of 30, give or take, right? That's all we talk about. We talk about the bits and pieces that make up the tabernacle. And again, we don't have a lot of this idea in the sense of, I guess, modern day churches but I want us to kind of get a grasp on how neat it is that he sets aside something because he wants to be with his people. You know, if you if you go back and you look at history, there are basically, well, I say basically, there are no gods, zero gods that have ever existed that desired to be with their people. They ruled over their people. They had their people do things for them, but none of them sought to be with them them. And yet, every time that we turn around, that's what God does. He, he seeks to be with his people. In this case, he wants to come and dwell and tabernacle amongst them. In our case, he sends his son to be part of uh, a plan to save us from sins because the sin separates us from God. So if he can remove that sin, then the separation does no, no longer exist. It's why he desires to call us his children, his sons and daughters. Uh, it's why he desires to draw us near to him no other God does this. It's a strange thing when you think of the history of other gods. And I, obviously when I say that, there is no other God, but you get my point in the sense of the way mankind has thought. As mankind has thought about the sun god, and mankind has thought about Atlas, and you know all of the Greek gods. And I mean, all these things, none of them desired to be, to be part of the people of this world. They wanted to rule and domineer and control and all of those things. God wasn't that way. God, yes, still rules. God, yes, still makes laws. But God is the person who desires greatly to 
draw people to him, to have a relationship with those people. And because of that, he begins here very simply by, by choosing uh, to put people together. Look for me uh, there in verse 10 of chapter 25. Here's the Ark of the Covenant. It should be very important to you and I because of what will be inside of it. It'll be very important to you and I because it will be a big deal uh, to God's people for a long time, all the way up until it's finally stolen and taken away. Um, let's see what the arcs can be made out of in verse 10. You should make an arc of a cacia wood. Two cubits and a half should be its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, a cubit and a half its height. All right, stop for a second and think. Has there been any other time where God has been this specific about building something? Uh, let's see, uh, Miss Lauren Patrick. Any other time? That's right. We built the wonderful boat, right, that Noah floated on. Look at what he did, right? He wanted it this high, this many rooms, this many levels, all of these things. You're going to see a whole lot of things. But look, what does he expect? Does he expect God's people to, to cut corners, right? I mean, Wendy's, right? Work like Wendy's. Don't cut corners. Got the square burger. We, we, we aren't, we aren't going to cut corners. We are going to do it exactly the way that he asked. Look at these things. He says, verse 11, you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and outside. You shall cover it. shall make it uh, on it a molding of gold around it. You shall cast four rings for gold in it. And put them uh, on its four feet, two rings on one side and two rings on the other. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. And you shall put the poles and the rings and the sides of the ark to carry the ark by them. Very interesting note, which we will get to eventually. Number one, notice what type of wood it's made out of, acacia wood. Number two, these poles basically are like you would think about, you know, carrying, uh, you know, some heavy thing in between two poles between two people. Well, there's two on each side. So four people would carry uh, the Ark of the Covenant. But notice what it says. It says the poles are for carrying the Ark. And there's a reason why. God will not have anyone touch this Ark. No one. Once it is built, it's not to be touched. The reality is we'll eventually see a man who chooses to do so. And he chooses to do so because he's doing the right thing in his mind. And yet it will cost him. It will cost him greatly. We'll get to that point. But again... These things are interesting when you go back and look, when you have the ability to read things now and then go back and see them and how they how they played out. You get the ability to stop for a second and go, you know what, I can't believe that God had already said that was going to happen and then that happened. Yep, it's exactly what happened. I mean, as honest as I can say it, that's exactly what happened. So I want us to to get more into the ideas of you know, sometimes God gives little instructions that seem not important. Sometimes teachers, parents, they make these little statements. And at the time, they don't seem, you know, they don't seem bad because why? Well, mom and dad weren't yelling. Uh, mom and dad didn't say, if you don't do this, then this happened. And, and yet we didn't listen to the small instruction. And the small instruction was the one thing that could have saved us from the issues that were to come down the road. Here in this case, God gives us simple instruction, something that we pass over as we think about this needing to be two cubics and a half its length and a cubic and a half its breadth. When we think about how it's got to be measured and made out of a cake of wood and covered in gold and how it's going to have cherubim set on top of it and all of these things, we lose that point. And yet, is that verse any less important than the other verses that surround it? It's not. You all know that. So I want us to, to think and get an idea about how, how significant it is that God doesn't choose to not inform. I mean, he doesn't hide things. He's not like a trickster. He's not trying to, to trick you up and to have you go, ooh, I made a mistake and it cost me my life. Nope, it's not. He's trying his best to stand before you and to give instruction and then to watch you follow it. It's pretty much his plan. So I want us to kind of get that mental thought in our minds as we read through some of this and as we see things in our day-to-day life as to whether or not some little instruction was very vital. Perhaps it was uh, as we go through things, right? I mean, think about how many times that I just quietly made a comment about us being quiet in class, and yet it's already cost us, right, with a pop quiz or two or whatever else it is. Uh, The truth is is that we can't can't miss that instruction. we got to be smart enough to to hear the little thing and to go, you know, I need to be better about this, if you think of it. Uh, Look for um, verse 15. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They shall not be taken from it. Why? Well, because God's people, are they currently where they're supposed to be yet? Where, Where are they, James, where are they going right now? What place are they headed to? 
That's right. They're headed to the land of Canaan. Are they there yet? Nope. So if you had something that you can't move without the poles and you aren't at the place you're supposed to be yet, then what do you do? Well, you leave the poles in it. That way, guess what? When you need to pack up the tabernacle, the tent, and move it, that's what you do. You move it. You go to the next place, the next place. That's God's people make their journey towards the land of Canaan. Um, look at verse 17. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length, cubit and a half its breadth. You shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work. Shall, uh, shall you make them on two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on one end and one on the other end. Of one piece uh, with the mercy seat shall make the cherubim in, on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings. Their faces one to another towards the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put, notice this, the testimony that I give you. That's the word we use for law. Okay, There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So on top of this, they're to put what? Basically two angels, if you think of it that way. Cherubim are guardians. Uh, they are winged creatures, typically. He wants them to be facing one another. He wants them to be covered in what? Pure gold, basically a very expensive box, if you want to think of it this way. Uh, that is built, made, and ready to, to travel. Inside of it, so far, we know that one thing exists, and that is the law that is being given. So I want us to think about that. Look at verse 23. You can see the heading there. A table for bread. Right? Showbread is what we typically refer to this as. You should make a table again of what? Acacia wood. Two cubits should be its length, a cubit its breadth, a cubit and a half its height. You shall overlay it with, let's again, look at this, pure gold. Make a molding of gold around it. You shall make a rim around it, uh, uh, a hand breadth wide, and a molding of gold around the rim. You shall make it with four rings of gold and fasten the rings to the four corners of its four legs. Close to the frame of the rings shall lie, uh, shall lie as holders for the poles to carry the table. You shall make the poles of a cake you would and overlay them with gold. And the table shall be carried with these. And you shall make its plates and dishes for incense and its flagons and bowls with which to pour drink offerings. You shall make them of pure gold. And you shall set the bread of the presence of the table before me. Notice this regularly. Okay? You're going to see a golden lampstand that's going to exist uh, there in uh, verse 31. It says, You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. It shall be made of hammered work. Its base, its stems, its cups, calyxes, and its flower, flowers shall be of one piece with it. In other words, he says, I'm not asking for you to build me something that some average person can do. He says, I'm expecting you to do so with your best skilled workers. to Take a single piece of gold and make these things out of it. Look, uh, verse 32, and there shall be six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand on one side, three on the other, stand, other side, three cups make like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flowers on one branch, and three cups like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flowers on the other. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand, and on the lampstand itself, there should be four cups made like almond blossoms and their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece, uh, and with it each their each pair of their six branches going out from the lamp, lampstand. Their calyxes, their branches shall be of one piece with it, the whole of a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamps shall be set up as to give light on the space in front of it. Its tongs and trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made with these utensils out of a talent of pure gold, and see what you make them uh, after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain. So again, he is basically giving this instruction. He is saying, this is what I want made. In this case, you've seen this uh, probably pretty frequently, especially when we come to the ideas of Christmas and Hanukkah, uh, as we have this seven candled lampstand, if you think of it that way. Uh, there's one in the middle, and then there are three that come off the sides. Uh, he was very specific about what he wanted them made with. He was very specific about the way that he wanted them ornately designed. Uh, the uh, flowers that existed there, almond flowers and all the things, the leaves that make them up. So it, it shouldn't be complicated to discover that this is what is required of God's people. Just do what he asks. Now look at the tabernacle, the actual tent, if you call it. More of you should make a tab tabernacle. Notice this, with ten curtains of fine twined linen. Again, let's stop for a second. James already told us that God's people were not where they were supposed to be yet. Unless he's not here today, in which case, 
that whole thing just failed, right? But God's people are not what they're supposed to be. If they build a building out of stone, and then they leave here and they go to the land of Canaan, what are they going to have to do when they want to tabernacle and dwell amongst God? That's right, they're going to have to journey back out of Canaan and into the wilderness. But if they take it with them, they don't have that problem. They're travelers. They're sojourners, right? Movers through a land is how we would define that. Visitors for a time being. And so the end result of this is that God's having them build something that is, yes, substantial, but is mobile. That way this thing can be taken to the next area and the next area. Um, look at uh, verse 2. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits. The breadth of each curtain, 4 cubits. All the curtains shall be the same size. Five curtains shall be cu uh, coupled to one another. And the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain. Uh, likewise, you shall make loops on the edge of the outermost curtain. Look at verse 7. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair uh, for, for a tent over the tabernacle. Eleven curtains shall you make. The length of each curtain shall be 30 cubits. He's going to continue to go down. Look at verse 11. You shall make 50 clasps of bronze and put the clasp into the loops and couple the tent together that it may be a single hole. Basically, he made a shower curtain. It's legit, what he's pretty much making is he makes these curtains. He's using loops, right, at the top, just like this. Loops the top of those curtains, and he's pretty much going to string them together. It's more or less what he's going to do. Um, verse 15, you should make upright frames for the tabernacle. Notice this again. Look at this wood. Hmm, seems like a test question. A cake of wood. Ten cubits shall be a length of the frame, and a cubit and a half and a breadth of each frame. There shall be two tenons in each frame for fitting together, so that you do for all the frames of the tabernacle. You shall make the frames for the tabernacle, twenty frames for the south side, forty bases of silver you shall make under the twenty frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons. So in other words, he says, I'm going to tell you how to make the poles. I'm going to tell you how to make the foundation so that it stands upright. I'm going to tell you how to lock them together. That's what a tenon would be, right? Uh, a tenon is like a joint. Okay, so you would take, you know, a, a square, you know, peg to go inside of a square hole, you know, like this, and it would lock it in. And so as it locks it in, it doesn't move. And since you're putting all the weight of all of these curtains and all the things that are there, you need to make sure that they're there. Uh, verse 26, you should make bars of a cakey wood, five for the frames of one side of the tabernacle and five bars to the frames of the other. The middle bar halfway up the frame shall run from end to end. You shall overlay the frames with gold. Look at verse 31. You should make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine twine linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia wood overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. You shall hang the veil from the clasp and, and bring the ark of the testimony in there, uh, in, in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate from you, notice this, the holy place from the most holy place. So I just want you to imagine a tent that's curtained off that behind it is only one room. That one room, as of right now, we know it has one thing in it, the Ark of the Covenant. And as of right now, we know its name, the most holy place. We also know the room we came out of, known as the holy place. We're going to see rules and regulations and laws that will be laid down to the priest in the sense of who can and cannot go into those places we're also going to discover something about this veil. It's going to be very, very important come a short time from now. And I say a short time. There's thousands of years probably between uh, this giving and Christ time on this earth. <clears throat> but the end result will be that God will separate himself from direct contact with the people. Christ will fix that problem. And we will see at least some idea of that, especially expressed to us when Christ dies on the cross. It says at that time when darkness came over the entire earth, it says the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. In other words, it created the ability for all of us to be the high priest who can go into that place, or the priest in this case who were not allowed to go in could now go in, thanks to the high priest being Christ. Again, you and I don't get to see this unless we read ahead, unless we see the future. I always used to think that, you know, I would rather live during Jesus' time. And if I saw him, well, then that would mean I believe in him and, and it'd be easy to believe in him. And yet there were so many people that saw him and didn't believe in him. And I think it's easier to do it now. I get to see the entire picture. I get to see all the foreshadowing and all the, the foretelling of things that he would do in the Old Testament. I get to see how it came true when he was here on this earth. I get to see what happened after he was gone. I get to see all those things by reading scripture. And so I, I don't think there's any way that it could be any better than to see us 
in our current situation right now to see. I don't know if I'm still recording. Hopefully, we're still recording there. <laughs> uh, since I just went away. Sorry about that. Um, but to me, it's it's just vital to see the amazingness that is in these small snippets of things that Christ is going to play a role in. This is why the Old Testament is so important. You know, we look past this so many times and we think it's no big deal. It is a big deal. This should have prepped us for things. And hopefully, uh, as we continue to live our life, we'll see that and do some more reading and do some more sharing to the point that we feel more comfortable going, you know what, look, it's pretty neat that God talked about that beforehand. You know, right now we don't get to see that, uh, but in the future, hopefully we will. Uh, look at verse 35. You shall sit the table. We already saw that table, right? Uh, over in verse 20 of chapter 25. You shall sit the table outside the veil, so not inside, right? Uh, the lampstand shall be on the south end of the table, tabernacle, opposite the table, and you should put the table on the north side. You should make a screen for the entrance of the tent, so to come into the tent at all, of blue and purple and scarlet yarn and fine, fine linen, embroidered with needlework, and you should make for the screen five pillars of cake wood and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold and shall be cast five bases of bronze for them. So now we have a building, tent, but a building, more or less. Notice now in chapter 27, there should be an altar. You should make an altar of a cake of wood, five cubits long. The altar should be square. Uh, look down in verse uh, 6, you should make poles for the altar. Notice this again, a cake of wood. Uh, look at verse 18, you shall make it hollow with boards as it has been shown you on the mountain, so shall it be made. It is interesting to see when he says, as it has been shown you on the mountain, it seems apparent that Moses and Aaron were given some form of a visual instruction as to what this should look like versus just telling them. Um, probably would help if me and you, right, were to be told these instructions and we just got to just guess which way we needed to sew it or whatever else. I'm sure we probably don't all. If I were to give us these same instructions to everybody in the class, I highly doubt we all come out with the same result. Right, unless we cheated and watched each other. So what happens is, is that is that in this case, we get to see that I, it seems like God gave them some kind of visual clue, either showing them in a vision or something along that line, so that now when they got ready to build something, they would know what it is that they're, they're shooting after, where they're, where they're looking to go. Look at the court. This is going to be outside the tabernacle. You should make a court of the tabernacle. On the south side of the court shall have hangings for five twine, uh, fine twine with 100 cubits long for each side. Uh, I'm going to look down at uh, verse 16. For the gate of the court, so it's closed off, right? In other words, not everybody gets to just go wandering up in there. Uh, it says, for the gate of the court, there should be a screen 20 cubits long of blue and purple and scarlet yarns, fine twine linen. 18, the length of the court should be 100 cubits, uh, breadth 50, height 5 cubits with hangings of fine twine, joint linen, and bases of bronze. All the utensils of the tabernacle for every use and all its pegs and all the pegs of the court shall be of bronze. Oil, you shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil. Well, guess what? They didn't buy it at Walmart. They had to make it. Uh, in the tent of meeting outside the veil that is for the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend to it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to be observed through their generations, the people of Israel. Now, 28. Now we're going to see the garments that will exist for the priest. In other words, it's going to describe how they should look, okay? What they should, um, what they should be dressed in, what it's made out of, all those things. Look at verse 1. Then you shall bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, from among the people to serve me as priest, Aaron and his sons, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, Ithamar, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful, whom I have filled with a spirit of skill, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. In other words, they're saying he needs to wear something to set himself apart. That's pretty much all that it's saying. Okay. Um, verse six, and they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, of purple, scarlet yarns, and of fine twined linen skillfully worked. It shall have two shoulder pieces attached to its two edges so that it may be joined together. The skillfully woven band on it shall be made like it. Uh, one of, be of one piece of gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarns, fine twine linen. It, it's going to be dressed in the best of the best, right? I mean, you could see all of that laid out for us here. Uh, look at verse 15. You should make a breast piece of judgment 
in skilled work, in the style of the ephod you shall make it of gold, blue, purple, scarlet yarns. It shall be square and doubled, a span in its length and a span in its breadth. Remember, a span basically is the length of a hand, right? Like from here to here, okay? Give or take. Uh, and so that's considered to be a span. Uh, look at verse 30. And in the breastpiece of judgment you shall put the Urium and the Thuman, and you shall and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart before the Lord. Notice this regularly. Okay, um, I'm going to go back for you there at verse 29. So Aaron shall bear the names of his sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance for the Lord. So in other words, the holy place. Remember, that is before the holy of holies or the most holy place, uh, as we call it. Okay, um, You see in verse 31, you shall make the robe of ephod of all blue. Look at verse 34, 35. And it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place. So watch this right here, verse 34. A golden bell and a pomegranate, and a golden bell and a pomegranate around the hem of the robe. So... He has this alternating golden bell, pomegranate, golden bell, pomegranate, over and over and over and over and over again. You ain't going to miss him when he comes. <laughs> He's literally going to be jingling like it's Christmas time. Okay, uh, So this is, again, part of what God wants to separate this man. And at the same time, it's part of it is, is to put him in a place of spiritual leadership for the people. Um, look at uh, verse 40. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and beauty. You shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him, and shall anoint him. Uh, look at verse 43. And they shall be on Aaron, on his sons, and they shall go to the tent of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister in the holy place. So now notice this. Aaron and his sons can both go into the holy place. We can at least see uh, that that's been given to us. Um, all right, so look at verse 29. Now we've got to clean these people. What this means is we have got to set them aside as priests and we have got to make sure that the people know that they are and we've got to take care of any sins and problems that these people have because they're about to serve for God's people. Okay, it's pretty much what's going to happen. So, uh, again, stay with me. I'm aware that we're talking about some old stuff here and there may be somebody in this room and I may be looking at the right side of my room over here that's already asleep. But, just pay attention and stay with me as we look at these instructions, not just to build a tabernacle, but these instructions of how God is going to set up the ideas of priestliness and high priest, etc. All those things are going to play a huge role as we look towards the future with Christ. Huge role. Um, verse 1 of chapter 29. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And you shall make of them fine wheat flour, and you shall put them in, in one basket and bring them in the basket, and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe, the ephod, the ephod, and the breastpiece, and gird him with a skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then... Bring his sons and put coats on them, and you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and, uh, and bind caps on them, and the priests shall be theirs by statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Will they remain in there forever? Well, Aaron and his sons aren't going to live forever, but they are from the tribe of what? Levi. So we will have priests from the tribe of Levi. Uh, the bull, nah, he's not going to have a good day. Verse 10, uh, you shall, Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord. At the entrance of the tent, why, why lay their head on the hand, uh, their hand on his head? Do you think for a moment it's to get a idea of what they're about to do? That they're about to take the life of a living creature? You know, it's easier to you know step back and to shoot a you know a bull from five hundred yards and to have no contact with it and not feel anything. It's a little more difficult to you know put your hands on something. It's why you know if, <clears throat> if you've ever been one of those people who've ever trapped uh, raccoons, you know raccoons are nothing but trash pandas. Uh, they're, they're, they're not the greatest of creatures. They may look cute, but don't play with one because they're ridiculously mean. But if you've ever trapped one, it's a difficult thing to walk to that trap and to shoot him because for some unknown reason, he has this tendency to 
give you these big pouty eyes as you're preparing to shoot him. And so pretty much if I've ever shot a raccoon inside of a cage, I've had to stick the gun over there, turn my head and pull the trigger because I don't want to see poor sad panda cry before I kill him. Well, that's exactly what he wants these people to do. He wants them to realize what they're doing. He wants them to see that it costs something because of sin. It's not free. It's not something that just happens. So I want us to get that concept in our head as we go through this. Um, look there at verse 12. You should take the part of the blood of the bull, put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, and the rest of the blood you should pour out on the base of the altar. Take all the fat that covers the entrails, uh, the long robe of the, of the liver, or lobe of the liver, and two kidneys with the fat in them, and burn them on the altar. But the flesh of the bull and its skin and its dung, in other words, uh, its manure, you shall burn with fire outside the camp. It is a sin offering. Uh, you should take one of the rams. Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. You shall kill the ram, take its blood, and throw it against the sides of the altar. You shall cut the ram in pieces, wash its entrails and its legs, and put them with its pieces in its head. Burn the whole ram on the altar. Um, <clears throat> look at verse 19, you should take the other ram, and Aaron and his son shall lay their hands on the head of the ram. You shall kill the ram and take part of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and on the tips of the right ears of his sons and on the thumbs uh, of their right hands and on the great toes uh, of their right feet and throw the rest of the blood against the sides of the altar. Then you shall take uh, part of the blood that is on the altar, the anointing oil, and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and the sons' garments. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his sons' garments with him. Uh, you will continue to read through the rest of this as you look through chapter 29. The same things are going to be said over and over about the things they want to do. Uh, verse 35, Thus you should do to Aaron and his sons according to all that I have commanded you. Through seven days you shall ordain them, and every day you shall offer a bull of sin a, a offering for atonement. For seven days. He's killing a bull every day. I, I want us to, again, not miss how serious it is that God's people have got sin issues, just like we do. And it costs something. It, it, it's, it's not free. Too many times we think that, you know, we can make things go away. I mean, you know, Peyton wrongs me, and he just says, I'm sorry. And I'm not saying that I'm not supposed to forgive him. That's not my point. But, you know, sometimes the fix for what he did wrong is doing his best to make it right. You know, I'm sorry that I stole from you. I mean, I'm not returning the money, and I still have it, but I'm sorry that I stole from you. Sometimes it cost us something to make that right. Sometimes the money that we stole got returned with five extra dollars because we said, you know what, that was the only way to make it right. God's people have to make it right. Guess what? They can't make it right on their own. Instead, it requires a sacrifice. Well, we'll learn shortly there in the book of Hebrews that the sacrifice of bulls and goats could never take away sin. So in other words, all of the death that existed from all of these putting hands on heads and then killing these bulls and these rams was never good enough to, to take sin away. And yet God still required it of them. Why? Well, because God very simply had rules and regulations, number one. And number two, God very simply wanted them to realize what their sin meant. Look, if, if every time you sinned, you had to go outside and shoot your favorite pet, I think a few of us would not have pets, right? Number one. Uh, and number two, veterinarians across the world would uh, be in a lot of trouble because they'd have no jobs at all because all of our pets would be dead. I want you to understand, that's my bell, by the way, not yours, uh, unless it just went off at the same time, which would be impressive. But I want you to get an understanding that what happens and how it happens here is so powerful. Because God has provided a way for us to see that sin is serious. You know, we don't get to see Christ on the cross. We weren't there. We don't get to lay a hand on him. But the truth is, is that's what we should feel. We should feel like we've had to take the life of him. And you know what? It's exactly what Peter said as he spoke to those people in Acts 2 there on the day of Pentecost. He says... For you have put to death the Son of God. And this is the same man who denied Christ three times, and yet he was willing to stand up now and to say that those people hung him on a cross. And some of those people had nothing to do with it physically. 
but they had to do with it because of sin and because of the rejection of Christ. We hung him on a cross, each and every one of us. Ava did. Aurora did. I did. Connor did. They all did. So what I want us to try to gain as we close today is I want us to understand these things that were set up are massively important because of how serious the sin issue is in the world and the amount of things that it's going to take in the future to fix that problem. That's the difficulty that exists. So I want us to think about it. I want us to pray about it as we spend our times trying to be better people. Hopefully, we have an opportunity to do that. There's nothing we can do besides try, nothing we can do besides think about it. Should it bring us to tears at times? Sure. But should we overcome those things? Yes. Because we realize the greatness that exists in God. We realize His love for us. And we realize His willingness to give everything He has to save us from sin. It's the entirety of what the entire Bible is about. God's people, sin, and a solution for it. It's basically what it is. Tomorrow, got a quiz for me. Hopefully you all do well. And then after that point, you've got some work for me to do uh, in class. Look forward to seeing back with you guys. Hopefully, if I'm not back already, look forward to seeing y'all uh, some point this next week uh, on Monday, Lord willing, uh, if everything is okay and I'm back in action. So look forward to seeing you guys. Take care. I uh, hope you have a great day.